into into the New York side of things. New York has been going well. This is a friend's place. Uh, I'm moving into. Sweet. I found a one month rental through this place called Outpost Club. Okay. And I'll be settling in there starting tomorrow, the first. Right, that makes sense. Stay there for the month, and then I'll see what's up after the first couple weeks there. If I like that part of town, if I want to look at a different part of town, but um, got a place to stay for a month and I'm excited for it. Dude. Amazing. Amazing, man. Congratulations on making that move. I know it's, uh, you know, you you enjoy it at one point, but then when you move too many times, sometimes it can get, it gets a little bit dreadful, but I'm glad you're enjoying uh, the move and, and you got some new energy. That's right. That's right. I love it. I love it. Um, no, dude, thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, dropping into the podcast. I, uh, I'm, I'm pumped to talk to you. I actually got to meet you in real life a few weeks ago when I was in uh, Vegas. Um, that was awesome just to sit down and have some coffee. And uh, yeah, man, uh, I, I think you have a lot of things going on on your side. And I just want to give you the floor a little bit to tell people who you are, how you got started, and then we can kind of go from there. That sounds perfect. I got how I got started. I, I'll start with what I'm doing now, I suppose. It's a better place to yeah. start out. Kind of so go backwards right now, a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right now, I'd say the main three projects that I work on are obviously I have a podcast that I've been doing for four years, and I can talk about the genesis of that in a moment. I have a ghostwriting business that specializes in email newsletters, usually weekly, sometimes daily. And then I also am involved with a data and analytics consulting firm. And typically, the way in which we help companies with data and analytics is reporting automation, I would say is the specialty. There's a lot of pieces to getting your data set up, right? There's like software engineering and building web apps, and there's lots of different pieces of that puzzle. Our main thing is building data warehouses such that we can help you build data visualizations. So you have an automated layer of insight into your data. Those are the three projects that I'm currently involved with. Uh, mainly I do sales and marketing for the businesses, obviously for the podcast to do a little bit of everything. And then I have a team of uh, co-founders that help with the fulfillment of all the work involved with all of the, the businesses. I love it. I love it. What, uh, wh which one of those do you enjoy at the moment doing, doing the most? Is it, is it still the podcast or has the energy kind of shifted a little bit? I think the podcast is structured such that it's what I almost guaranteed to enjoy the most because there's no okay. constraints around it besides, am I having fun? Like the businesses, yeah, exactly. they need exactly. to make money for me to consider them worthwhile. If they don't make money, those projects are failures, right? You could say it, nothing's right. really a failure. It's just like a lesson, but it's like the reason I do those things, th those are businesses. It's like saying, well, I got fired from my job and I didn't fail at the job. It's like, no, you got fired because you know, you were not a success for the job. So it's the same reason that if I'm not making money from the businesses, they're not successful pursuits. Uh, whereas the Makes podcast sense. is all about, and I think you do your show for a lot of the same reasons, right? Who do I get energy from speaking with? Who, what do I want to learn about? And if I'm getting on the phone with those people and having a good time, then that's everything it's supposed to be. But I am having a lot of fun with the writing business as well and metrics, but metrics, I'm really not doing much day to day anymore. <laughs> So maybe that's actually the most fun because my involvement is yeah. the, the latest. That, that, that is usually how it goes. Uh, I, I love that. Um, yeah, the podcast, tell me a little bit about it because uh, you, you uh, have a co-host, Lewis and Kyle Show, right? Um, tell me a little bit about how you guys got started. You mentioned like the genesis of it and what, what made that happen and, and, and uh, how has it evolved, I guess, is the biggest thing in terms of guests or content or anything like that. Yeah, I met Kyle in a very... I guess you could say typical sense. We were both at the same entrepreneurship competition. There was a startup weekend that our school had hosted. We went to the University of Alabama and we met at this event and competed against each other, kind of like hackathon, but for non-technical people. I was technical, but I just also participated in this non-technical event. And we got dinner later that week and kind of just immediately hit it off and became close friends. Maybe like a year later, he had started a mastermind series with a couple of his fraternity brothers. And we were not in the same fraternity. I was the only person who got invited to this from outside of his fraternity because I don't, I don't totally know why. And so we were hosting mastermind dinners in person with the same core group of five and then plus an outside guest. And then when the pandemic era had begun, we 
had to obviously take that remote. There are five of us on campus in Alabama. All five of us went distributed to different locations. We wanted to keep the tradition going and we wanted to record it because we basically had two or three of these conversations that were, I mean, we'd only done about two or three with guests and they were so awesome. We just like, we're having these energetic conversations about them as a group and we're like, oh, if only we'd recorded it. So that kind of had a very natural transition into the podcast. And we had a lot of time on our hands at the beginning of the pandemic, being in school with our classes at the time, switching from a graded system to a pass fail system for that semester. So that was awfully convenient. The <laughs> risk of not doing as well had been mitigated pretty dramatically. And that was the starting point. In terms of the evolution, the initial goal at the outset was really for us to meet entrepreneurs that otherwise didn't really have much of a reason to give us time. It was to have a reason to record the conversations with these people, right? Like you're not going to record a dinner at a restaurant. That's a bit strange, but a podcast, it would be more strange if you didn't record it, obviously. So kind of the social context. And then Kyle and I had both obviously interest in entrepreneurship, right? We'd met at a startup related event the year before, and we'd tried several projects, both of us that neither of which or none of which were ever particularly su uh, successful. And so we don't want to start any more businesses just for the sake of starting businesses. We, w we wanted to start businesses only when we actually had a thesis that was like, okay, I've learned a lot about business and this should actually work, not just because I want it to work, but because I've identified right, the right ingredients, a real problem with real demand in the growing market where the buyers have purchasing power and like the ingredients were like, oh, that's actually probably going to work. And the podcast was just something to do with ourselves until those ideas presented themselves to us in our lives. And since then, I've started a business. I've had several jobs that the podcast was also very helpful in connecting me with the right people to get those jobs. And it's likewise helped me go deeper in the industries that I'm choosing to build businesses by building relationships with people much further ahead, much more established in the industry. So they can kind of, I mean, even yourself, right? You've been in the agency game a long time. We met through the podcast. You've given me several pieces of quite good advice of things to steer clear of and things you're glad you did in your career. And so it's countless things like that have happened that I can attribute to the podcast. So what it really comes down to now is a couple of things. What am I just genuinely like interested in? What sounds really fun for me? So someone sends me an email, like a public relations company, and they're like, I want you to interview. I'm just going to make this up. Like the CEO of Vitamix that just came to mind. Yeah. Maybe like, I'm like, yeah. dude, I love Vitamix. <laughs> I want to talk to the Vitamix guy. Right? That's like yeah. the entire depth of how, of the decision for interviewing that guy. Just like something in my yeah. brain is like, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. And then other times it is right, more right. deliberate. It's like, okay, who's been successful at ghostwriting before? Let me find five mm -hmm. of those people and speak to them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, yeah, I think the podcast is, uh, is one of the greatest connection tools, in my opinion, the people that I've connected with and got to talk to. And uh, I definitely agree with all of that you, you, you just mentioned. Um, how, how and if is, is the podcast any way helping with those businesses now? Or is that something that you guys potentially plan on doing at some point and turning, you know, that as more of like a, some sort of marketing or self sponsorship type of avenue? for those businesses that you guys are starting? Yeah, it's not necessarily helpful in a deliberate or structured way. It is helpful incidentally. And like I said, I now prospect based on selfishly what I in my role feel most in need of. And mm -hmm. right now, it's actually funny. I don't think I'm very knowledge constrained. There's I'm sure lots of like unknown unknowns, like things I don't quite know that would be helpful. But actually, I think like I've gotten enough good ideas that I haven't fully finished. Like I went to the buffet of, of, of life and business advice, and I'm yeah. still eating yeah. from that same plate. I do not need to go yeah. put more stuff on that plate to have a, like a very right. full meal. And it's certainly helpful to like hear people yell at me and tell me the same lessons that I'm not quite fully applied yet either. Like I think it's viable to reread a book for a lot of the same reasons. But the primary intention is building relationships and cementing knowledge in things I think would be helpful for me to prevent myself from continuing to be the bottleneck for the business, because you're almost always the bottleneck. And if you're the owner right. of the business, if you're not like, even if you're not the bottleneck, you are the bottleneck because it's your responsibility to figure out what you could do to grow it even more. Otherwise your growth rate would be yeah. infinity. Yeah. And yeah. And I think that's kind of the, the beautiful part about when like podcasting, uh, you know, in, in that sense too, like, becomes the 
thing that you do becomes the main like thing. It just becomes this enjoyable way of connecting. And then I think it even turns the other way where you might be talking to somebody and you come up with a business idea and then person a year down the road becomes your business partner, like some, th something similar to what you and Kyle basically connected with. And it was at a different, you know, thing, but on the podcast side of things, I think there's a, there's a lot there. Um, but ghostwriting, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, that side of the, the spectrum, because that also kind of funnels into the online writing and things like that. So tell me a little bit about how you guys got into that. Have you always been doing a lot of your own writing or have you always kind of collaborated with people? What's the what's the backstory on your sort of writing uh, a writing career? I started publishing articles on the Internet in 2018. OK. And not super deliberately, just at first some book reviews right on a WordPress site that would get zero traffic. And then there was a period of time throughout college where I posted on Medium moderately consistently. And then I had a sub stack that I still have, but I haven't published since February of 2023. So it's hard to say that with 11 months off, it's been maintained actively. Though I do use the same list for, I moved my podcast to be hosted on Substack as the audio hosting platform because it automatically sends an email to all those subscribers. So I do ping that list weekly now, uh, just with a podcast related message, but it's not necessarily a proper Sweet. email. And then I don't really think I've done proper freelance writing work before launching Inbox Ghosts, but I have had a personal website where I've put up, I did ship 30 for 30 in like the third ever cohort. So maybe the second in February oh, of, of 2021. So it's pretty early with participating in that. And in my senior year leading up to graduation, that was in many ways what kind of my plan was. I was like, this is how I'm going to support myself when I get out of school and need to support myself. I'm going to be a freelance copywriter. I've seen a lot of people do it and that's what I want to do. And then kind of when I graduated, I didn't have enough urgency to need to make it work. I went and moved home. So obviously didn't have a rent payment. I was fortunate enough to go to school on a scholarship. So I didn't have any like student debt or anything like hitting me. And I did oh, yeah. work uh, a couple jobs and internships throughout college. So that summer I was kind of just enjoying living at home and working on the podcast. And I did write the podcast, uh, my newsletter still at that point weekly. But outside of that, I didn't have any urgency to make the business work. And so then I decided to move to Tennessee and start paying rent and start running out of money so that I did have urgency to figure out how to start making money. <laughs> I love and that. I love that. I had so much urgency that I decided to get a job to make money in a more surefire way than yet again, just like hoping I would figure out how to start a business. And right. so I worked, I started my first job September-ish of 2021. I worked in crypto for a full year. So until, eh, not quite a full year actually, uh, for not quite a full year, because I left <laughs> that my second job in crypto in like August of 2022 to start Orbit Metrics or to join my existing co-founder with Orbit Metrics and start those businesses. And then after the first year of running Orbit Metrics, we decided to spin off Inbox Ghosts. So it's the same team that runs Inbox Ghosts, kind of as the everything I've wanted to do in business and all the lessons I learned from year one, specifically what the biggest challenges were in terms of sales and marketing. I wanted to, now I felt ready to start the writing business based on like what I learned and the experience that I have accumulated and the specific pain points that inspired me to start it with the sales and marketing process for Orbit Metrics is, you know this, you ran a development related arm of your uh, consulting firms. It's very yeah. hard to have standardized packages for development. You can you know, have a mm -hmm. standardized hourly rate and you can say, we only work with buckets of hours. So you have to get on a 40 hour per month retainer or an 80 hour per month retainer. But at the end of the day, it's still hyper custom work. And it's harder to build like efficiencies because unless everyone happens to want the same app, you're probably not going to charge two people the, twice for the same app. You would just sell them the access to the app once you have it built. And it's also very expensive and high touch. So all of the things that made sales and marketing difficult for Orbit Metrics, I wanted a business that didn't have the same problems. So something right. with a more accessible entry point, a standardized fulfillment so that we can start to build processes and subcontract more easily. And then also very selfishly, like personally, it is the business that I wanted to have built. I never had the dream of building the data analytics consulting firm, but I did have kind of that dream of figuring out how to support myself with a writing related business. 
Yeah. And I feel like, uh, I mean, uh, as you just mentioned, it kind of happened to me as well, where I went from building a, a team of people, we got to like 26. And then you just realize it's the b best lesson is like, you realize the things that you don't like about that. And then you just go off and like, come up with a new idea, spin that off and try something that has a lot less of your need. Like you said, maybe for the first four to five to eight months, whatever that time frame is, you build out processes, you you work through that, you know, that that hard labor where you have to sit there and document everything you're doing and then just mm -hmm. kind of compile it and make that like this is the steps we follow for every project that comes in. I mean, that's I think that's beautiful. And I think you and I talked about just a different kind of AI related work that can go into it as well as like the content and everything else that's going on into it and make that job a lot easier than having to do absolutely everything manually so um yeah man that, i think that's that's really awesome and do you guys use any uh ai related tools in inbox ghosts or or uh on the orbit metric side do you guys utilize that as a as a kind of part of your tech stack or is it a little bit too early for you guys to do that oh we definitely use ai throughout the business in a lot of ways um mm -hmm. some of the creative uses you know maybe we're keeping the cards close to the chest on that but it's definitely yeah. something that's in the business, right? Any, we, we don't say AI, give me a newsletter and then AI gives me a right, newsletter, right? right? Of it's, course. it's not quite there yet, but it's, you know, you're staring at the, you're staring at the body of the email and you're like, I just wrote an email about this. These are a few of the articles that I referenced some of the headlines within there, like help me generate subject lines, right? I think from things on that level, it's quite useful. And same thing. It's like, mm -hmm. let's say I wanted to cite an academic study that was like 3000 words. Fortunately, that does fit now into GPT-4. So I could just upload the PDF and say like, hey, summarize this PDF into 30 bullet points. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. now I have... So in terms of compressing each of the tasks involved to make them slightly more efficient, but it is not, hey, chat GPT, my client is shopify.com. I have to write them a newsletter, get, fabricate a story about XYZ, here, and then it's done. So it's helpful yeah. in a lot of small ways that accumulate right. to saving a lot of time. Yeah, absolutely. And and understanding how to how to use it and what to prompt it to get what you need out of it. So you don't have to sit there for, you know, 45 minutes trying to figure out like what you need and uh, kind of go through these oh, different, yeah. you know, so that's, I think, a really, really big piece of it. Um, On the data side of, too, oh, yeah. um, just yeah, quickly yeah. so I can give one other piece, an example I feel a bit... Uh, irresponsible for not mentioning, let's say. But <laughs> <laughs> we do a lot of SQL, obviously. Like, so for right. anyone who, you know, SQL, um, that's like the language that you use to manipulate data and interact with a database. And sometimes you have to do something that you don't have to do very often. And you're like, how the hell do I, I do not remember how to do X, Y, Z in SQL. Like I'm trying to join this table with this table and have the data sorted in this such way. And I forget the syntax for that because it's been three weeks since i had to do that um and then so you asked chat gpt to like help you remember like little programming hacks and that is like a massive thing yeah no i love that i love that i mean i think uh at the end of the day i think that we're, we can all understand that the technology is here to stay but i also don't think it fits into every business to use it you know at full throttle basically it's like use it for the pieces to make more efficient uh, efficient workflows, you know, uh, processes, keep, take, take your, your, your brain dump of things and say, here's the things that I need laid out in this format, clean this up, you know, that kind of stuff where I feel like you are saving so much money on the, you know, hiring people, figuring out who can work the fastest and who can get that, you know, kind of that, um, sort of virtual assistant type of work, I would say done a lot quicker and, uh, and just in a specific way i think that's those are the kind of ai things that go really really hand in hand especially if you like messing around with that kind of stuff which i personally do i love just tapping into it, seeing what it can do and how it could transform things and you know all this other stuff so that's that's really really awesome and what are um i don't know if you want to share or not but what are some uh new things or ideas or businesses or or uh, I guess maybe even AI related stuff that you're looking into that you're just like, Hey, this is something else that, you know, maybe once you get these businesses a little bit to a further point that you'll be able to kind of build on, on some of those additional like new technologies. Like, is there anything out there right now that's kind of simmering in that brain? I think a lot of the image stuff is underutilized. Mm -hmm. 
I think a lot of the image stuff is underutilized for, I mean, you saw it with, I'm assuming you saw it, Peter Levels on for Twitter. For business purposes you're talking about, right? Because I think people are using it a lot more for personal stuff, but are you talking about like more business related stuff? Oh, you're saying like from a process perspective or from a product perspective? Uh, product uh, perspective, like building something out, but are you saying it's being uh, underutilized by, you know, like the mid journeys are being underutilized by like the users, or are you saying the way people are using that technology is underutilized? I think that there's lots of categories of image creation that could be productized with these technologies. Okay. Is I what I'm saying. I see. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So like just how wanna, Peter wanna... Levels kind of made a, a tool to help people kind of rapidly design interior design ideas. And I don't totally know what he did besides, you know, expose an API to a web app where people obviously pay on like a per usage right. basis that helps them, you know, to create interior designs. But I, I don't know what he did to manipulate, you know, kind of guide the users to use the API in such a way that leads to better results. Because there's obviously ways with these, you know, talking to the robots, it's like, if you speak their language and you put things in parameterized the right way, you get the results that she wants. And if you don't, you don't. And so that's the point of these, most of these wrapper applications is basically mm -hmm. helping someone who wouldn't know how to read the documentation and wouldn't know how to like adjust the parameters correctly to actually get the full power of the app towards their use case. And I just think like, you know, I'm like looking around the skyline, right? I'm like looking at the window and seeing like buildings and architecture. And like, I mean, like images are a huge part of like everything. And yes, the fact that the, and also I haven't seen, so that's one thing I'll say, and then multimodal, meaning the fact that these same model, same interface can both understand you audibly, like it can hear you speak. So voice to text, and it can obviously just understand natural text. I mean, the point is like, we have not fully come to grips with what is possible when you have a machine capable of reasoning and thinking and reading and following instructions. And there's a lot that you have to get right to proceed through multi-step processes such that there's not cascading errors, meaning like a mistake in step one. If it like, let's say you have a 10 step workflow and the first step is yeah. you give it an image and it's supposed to understand the contents of that image and then do 10 other things based on the contents of that image. If it misinterprets mm. the contents of that image, right? It's just going to end up, it's like the game of telephone and it's just going to end up like, you know, sending a smoothie to your house. When what you actually exactly. wanted was <laughs> like, not, yeah, I'm thinking about smoothies clearly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like you actually just wanted like to book a flight and instead it just like you shipped your smoothie. neighbor a smoothie. Exactly. But yeah, there's way, I think the big opportunity is people who can figure out how to narrowly confine the intended task mm -hmm. such that the quality bar is a hundred percent. Right. So it's like mm. you define a workflow yeah, yeah. and you figure out every potential thing that could go wrong and put on like not like 97 checks of just right. like the most common things that could go wrong. And it like brute force checks every potential error scenario such that you've delivered a nice tight workflow where you can say mm -hmm. with confidence, right? This is why a lot of people don't use Siri regularly because it's like you've asked it a bunch of stuff. Like it's not because Siri is bad. It's because Apple did a poor job of, of framing it. They're like, this is a general assistant that can help you with anything. And I'm not saying right. I know how to do it. Right. Better, right? But right. It, they set the expectation as like, this is Jarvis from Iron Man. This is your intelligent assistant. It can help you with literally everything. And then you ask it one mm -hmm. thing and it doesn't know how to do it. And you're like, this is useless. Versus if they said instead, this app based on voice commands can help you make phone calls and send text messages and set alarms people would probably use it all the time for those three things if it was framed in that way. So basically nail a couple of things and like actually nail them and then only sell the things that you've nailed. And then there's yeah. lots of opportunity. It's the same reason that lots yeah. of people don't, you know, why isn't ChatGPT adoption like a hundred percent? Because mm -hmm. people go in there with no instruction besides just like, it's useful, try it. What does that mean? Right, it's useful, right, useful right, for what? Right, right. They ask it to help them with something, it doesn't do a good job of that specific particular task. And they declare that it's useless. And that's right. why everyone's still right. successful selling an application that just helps you do one thing. Cause you're like, oh, I would need to do that thing. 
And hopefully if they've delivered an application that only does that thing, it actually works. And then people are like, yeah. this helps me do the thing. I need to do the thing. I'm going to keep using this. That's, it's just yeah, it, not that's confusing people very, it, and not yeah, failing. It's just like take a subset of the big thing and just create something a little bit. I like exactly. that. I, I love that you do. You mentioned that because we do get mad, not mad. You know, you look it down and you're just like, man, you're selling this thing for, you know, X amount of dollars. And it's just like, like you said, a, G, a GPT wrapper. But at the same time, it's like there's a use case and people are paying for it and that we shouldn't be mad about it. We should actually embrace that tightness of that product just to say, hey, this is your uh, essay helper. Like it helps you write your essays for school, for your university or whatever else it is. And that's all it does. People would know how to approach it differently to- It creates a frame uh, of even... mind. Exactly, exactly. Which it's is not useless. Like, and again, right, when you think right. more broadly about the world and how it works, it's like, why do you go to a coffee shop? Right. It's like your desk and coffee at home are just as good and you can play ambient mm -hmm. music, but it's like, no, when I go to a coffee shop, I don't know. I just feel different. Cause it's like, it is purpose built for doing work or something. Yep. And same thing. Yep. It's like, exactly. why do you ever buy cooked food? Like you can get beef from the store. It's like, well, I just want to like eat in that environment and have a break. It's like, there's a lot of psychology at play. We're not like. Reducing the world to simple pieces is sometimes a useful exercise and sometimes it isn't. Yeah. Are you, are you somebody that, um, I know you've been working, uh, uh, out of a office for a while and you kind of are on your own time. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about like the traveling too, but are you somebody when you're at home or let's say you're not in a co-working space, are you pretty good at keeping yourself pretty tight with the work or do you, are you kind of distracted with different things? You get kind of like. You know what I mean? Like just what you mentioned about the coffee shop, you go in there and it's like your desk, your coffee, your laptop, whatever you're working there. There's just like a different energy. Are you somebody that's very, uh, um, I guess, what's the word? Like you police yourself really well on that? Mm. I'm going to say no. Or you're kind of like the, yeah, <laughs> picking, I'm up, say pick, no. picking up the, picking up the phone all the time. Type, you know what I mean? Like kind of getting distracted or you feel like, I'm in this place and I just need to do the work that I came here to do. Unfortunately, I'm very rarely the second kind. Yeah, yeah. it's, I <laughs> so, very rarely have like, not very rarely. I, I, I need to do a better job of, I should spend 30% of my week working on my to-do list. So meaning like right. on the, like, am I sure that I'm working on the right things? Do I, have these been identified since that the first action step is clear and there's a time estimate and it's I've, I have buy-in. So for client work right now, that's actually been what's been my most productive, though it's like the least profitable use of my time right now. But right. it's easy because it's like, okay, you bought my newsletter from me. I owe you one Wednesday at noon. I've made this commitment to you. I took responsibility for it. And writing the newsletter is a very well-defined task. Like I'm not procrastinating that work. I'm doing it all the time. And when I'm doing it, I'm not checking my phone. I'm just doing it. But everything else in my business, which is a lot more ambiguous, is like, it tends to be like, I don't write it out where it's so, so hyper clear. Like I have to kind of come up with stuff. It's just more higher order, more frontal lobe, prefrontal cortex, other brain words, like work, like define yeah. who I want to target in my next, like, I'm going to do another round of cold outreach to see what other potential segments resonate to this offer. And that's non-deterministic work, or at least yeah. I haven't made it deterministic yet. Like I should sit down again, when I'm going up my, my plan for the week and say, okay, that's one of the tasks I need to work on. What is the definition of done for that task? And setting that before, basically anytime I try to set, start a task where there is not a clear definition of done, and you're trying to both come up with that at the same time you're doing the task, that's kind of like a red alert recipe for disaster versus yeah, instead yeah, I said, you're so right. my task, yeah, if instead the task was like, I, let's say yesterday, I'd already thought through, okay, my goal is just to come up with a TAM of at least 60,000 people to reach from three distinct segments where two of them are customers I already have, right? So I'm just saying, okay, well, clearly, you know, so we, we just started writing a newsletter for a real estate agent. Right. And so I'm like, okay, now I have a piece of evidence that if one real estate agent wants a newsletter, maybe several will. So I know at least one of my targeting strategies should be to sell to more real estate agents. 
And so mm-hmm. two of these categories I'm reaching out to should come from existing client archetypes that I'm now generalizing. And then one of them should be like, uh, well, maybe I just never interviewed any restaurant owners and maybe the restaurant would want one. And I just have a hypothesis. It's not based on any evidence, mm-hmm. but it, and so if I had written that out, then I go to actually do the task and it's like, okay, this is achievable. This is something I can do. If I just focus for the next 30 minutes, it'll probably be done. Versus instead I have a very ambiguous task, which is like define my ICP for the next quarter. And I'm like, yeah, that could take all day. Like I could stare at the window for 20 <laughs> hours and not have the answer to that. So yeah. breaking down thought work into achievable pieces is something I don't do a great job at, which is like a cause of a lot of procrastination because the work is a lot more dreadful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's almost like, yeah, finding something to break down that that big thing into pieces that are actually achievable. I actually had somebody on the podcast recently that built that uh, actually as an app where you say, I want to start a, I, for example, I want to start a podcast and it'll start to break down that like end goal into mm-hmm. small pieces that can help you achieve that. So it's called a uh, brick doc or a join brick or something like that. It's a really kind of a cool concept that really uh, enjoy. And he's using like AI now to kind of help you take it a step further if you want and like come up with things. It's, it's pretty cool. I mean, again, another task tool that I think can, you know, be utilized really well if you actually sit down and, 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 you know, do the work and kind of go through that. Now I'm very much like you, I get that a little bit of that distraction. I've been trying to, use journaling as a little bit more of like a focus point where that, Mm -hmm. you know, going from that and having my headphones on, being in a zone, noise cancellation, like piece of paper, pen, and then letting that sort of flow into the next piece of work, whether that's something, I mean, the minute I opened my thing, I I made it, made it a a task, like at the end of the day to close on all my tabs. So I don't wake up to just panic of anxiety type of thing. You know what I mean? So uh, just these little things that I think, (laughs) Yeah, it just like hits you yeah. like a wave. You're just sitting there and you're just like, oh shit, what did I, what was I working? What like, and you automatically lose that, um, you know, lose that train of thought and that flow that you just kind of built up for the past like 30 minutes. So, um, but tell me a little bit about uh, your travels. I know that you've been kind of moving around. And I think uh, when you and I talked, it was something enticed you about moving to New York to get that new sense of energy, you know, spark a fire under your ass a little bit. Like, tell me a little bit about kind of the journey of getting to New York where you were at before. And um, I don't know if you have a favorite place so far that you've been, but I'd love to hear that as well, because you've been you've been kind of going solo with that, uh, from what I understood last time you and I chatted. Yeah, I'm hesitant to like go too hard into the New York pitch because I've been here for two weeks and I booked a place for a month. I committed to another month here, but I, it's, I've not locked myself into anything more than that. So who knows? Like I, I, pl- I plan to stay here for a while, but a while is also like subjective. Mm-hmm. And right. uh, you know, I don't know your your lag time on publishing, but it's entirely possible that you publish this and I'm like already somewhere else. So I am that's not to say that's not to say I'm not liking it. That's just to say I could get a phone call from someone who's like, dude, I'm going to be like two of my friends are going to Peru for all of March. And I'm just like, I don't have a reason <laughs> to not be there with them. Really? I'm just like, you know what I mean? And yeah, that's yeah, not no, anything against awesome. New York. It's just like, I'm like, I could go to Peru for March. It's probably better weather in March. Then I could come back here in May. Like who, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, I'm going to preface with that. Uh, and so maybe that was revealing into like the attitude I've had about travel. I, pre- I, pre- I appreciate that from all, <laughs> I appreciate that from all angles, the spontaneity angle. And also just like the, Hey, I don't know what the fuck is going to kind of happen type of thing. So I, I appreciate exactly. that. Exactly. And I think that back to kind of like structure and some of these other things we were discussing, like it's, it's the, you know, the term like alignment and like, and, I mean, astronomy, right? The the, the idea of like the stars aligning. I kind of think of like that metaphor. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have a lot of things aligned for certain things to be successful. And if things are out of alignment, they're not successful. And I I very much see the world that way. Like, for example, if you listen to Alex Hormozzi, like he gives a lot of the reason that a lot of his motivation was, right? He tells the story of like his dad didn't believe in him. His dad never wanted him to quit his job. His dad wanted him to stay on the traditional path. And so he had this like Mm -hmm. very burning desire to be an entrepreneur because like he was so motivated to prove his dad wrong that like, and was so afraid 
of the idea of his dad saying, I told you so. And so Alex Hormozzi is someone who's just like hates on morning routines. He's like, morning routines are so dumb. You just get up and get to work. And I'm like, that's not necessarily true for everyone. Because for me, right. I don't have that good of a motivation for being an entrepreneur, right? Like, I don't feel like I don't have another option. A lot of like, I definitely feel sometimes I'm like, I could just go be a software engineer. And like, I'd make fine money. Like, I don't need that expensive of a lifestyle and software engineers make good money. And I like writing code. And like, I didn't really like, I feel like I've been successful as an entrepreneur. Like I could be obviously more successful. I could make more money. And, but it's like, I've kind of proven that I can do it and I know it's going to work out for me. And I'm kind of just doing this because I want to. It's like for me, a morning routine where I'm like reminding myself of my why is kind of like helpful because it's like, this is voluntary suffering and I could, and I could end it. Cause like, I don't hate job. Like this is also like, I really decided I want to be an entrepreneur like before the pandemic. So when remote work was a lot harder to come by, but now it's like, Mm -hmm. I've seen the lifestyle of a lot of remote software engineers. I'm like, that could be really rad. Like, I don't have to worry about these things. I have to worry about as a business owner. Like I see mm-hmm. a lot of advantages to it. So for me, I actually do have to spend time periodically realigning my motivations to remind myself why it's worth it. Where someone like Alex, there was no option. And so, yeah, like, I think yeah. that's- I see. It's like, he comes from a completely different angle than you do from exactly. so many different perspectives. Exactly. Like, I don't have this like fear of my relationship with my parents crumbling if I don't make it as an entrepreneur. Right. But, and right. so, but like, if I did, I probably could wake up out of bed every day at 4 a.m. and just start grinding because it's like I have that core motivation. So, all that to say, separate scenario, separate alignment analysis. When I was traveling, sorry, when I graduated college, I was traveling. I didn't have any expenses really. And so, I was not properly aligned to be successful as an entrepreneur, right? Because it was like I didn't need to make the money. I didn't have a specific idea I was motivated to get out into the world. I just kind of had a loose intention. And you just try to start mm-hmm. a business knows that if that's like your mindset, you're probably not going to be successful because like it's the second it gets difficult, you're just like, this sucks and I don't need to make right. it work. And when you're traveling, it's just like your motivation is to travel. And so I'd, I'd have a really hard time getting any work done on the road. Whereas now I'm firmly established in my business. I have obligations, right? I have clients. I have projects that I am personally responsible for delivering. And so it's very easy for me to focus now on the road because it's like, I I don't care where I am. Like, I got to get this done. Like, I made a promise to this guy. I like this guy. I like having a good Mm -hmm. reputation. I got to get this done. And so there's like absolutely no difficulty whatsoever for me to like post. I think kind of a heuristic for this is the more obsessive you are about how comfortable your work setup is, the more fragile your commitments or your motivations are to what you're doing. Right. So whenever I like, like when I had a job, I was like, I can't get work done because I'm not comfortable. It's like, that's not quite the case. It's like, if my desk wasn't at the right height, my arms were too, my arms were like this and they should be like this and my shoulders hurt. And that just bothers me. I can't get anything done. It's like, no, I just like, okay, I'm not that motivated to do the work. Cause now it's like, I've been cranking on airplanes. Cause it's like, I got to get this done, man. Combined into that time frame too. And you're like, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, this could not, this, there, I couldn't be in a least, a less comfortable position. And I've had no problem focusing. It's not about the setup. It's about the setup in your mind. That sounded, that sounded like hilarious, yeah, but it's, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. It, it's true. So like there was a time in Scottsdale again, where I was again, just like obsessed with how many monitors I had and the angle and the chair and the desk and the coffee and the water. It's like, no, I just all the motivated. It, <laughs> all the it's, it's all properly <laughs> nonsense. And so now it's like, I can be in the least distracting work environment. As long as the the only thing that actually matters is like internet connectivity and internet speed. But as long as that's the case, I'm confident enough in my commitment and need to get the work done that I could be in Peru and still will work as much as if I was living at my parents' house with literally nothing to do except work. Mm -hmm. Um, So all that to say, you know, I've had a lot of good bagels since I've been in New York. Um, rants, rants aside, <laughs> I've had a lot of good bagels. No, that's, that's, I'm, I'm so glad you went <laughs> off on that, uh, off on that uh, tangent, because I think, uh, it triggered something thinking about all the, um, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like all of the travel stuff that you're doing right now. But like, I think about time confinement from a social media perspective as well as like, we are so quick to click on 15 different things and do 15, like I said, even just the tabs and all this other stuff. It's like, 
that time confinement and almost setting yourself a timer in 15, 30 minute spurts to say, you know, uh, do, don't like, don't look at your phone until you feel that like vibration go off and you're just like, okay, now I could do the next thing or I can continue that. Like, I think there's something really to that in the time that we live in now. Cause I think everyone is just completely consumed by others and what others are doing and comparing themselves and they're not putting enough of that time into the things that they can actually be doing and i do feel like especially when you're just getting started as an entrepreneur it's very hard to do that because you're constantly trying to new, learn new things do new things and uh, understand and read and research and like there's so many layers to it but i guarantee that if you just were to confine yourself to like spending 30 minutes to an hour of uninterrupted kind of like I need to get this done don't knock on my door don't do anything like I need to get this done and you confine yourself to that time you get a lot more effective work done, and your brain would start to think differently like you would fall into that natural flow where you can start extending that to an hour and a half two hours very very quickly and I think uh I, I'm so glad you touched on that because it is a it is a mind, mental set. And I know when I travel, when I was in Vegas, it was like so easy for me to be like, these are the three things I need to get done. I could pull up literally anywhere. But sometimes when I'm at home and like my dog is in here and like there's these little like things that happen, then all of a sudden you start to like pull that away from, you know, the the actual stuff that you need to be confined to. So I'm, I'm glad you touched on that. that. That was a good rant and tangent to go off in my opinion. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, tell me about some of the other spots where you've uh, where you've lived and what you enjoyed about them and, and what kind of like drew you out of there, I guess. is like you said, you went to Tennessee, you did a bunch of stuff like what's some other spots that you've been to that, um, you know, you, you, you either enjoyed or you're just like, ah, this is just not the place for me. Yeah, I have for the most part enjoyed everywhere that I've been. There's just certain draws to certain places again at different times in my life. The... I went to school in Alabama. Alabama's great. Tuscaloosa okay. is a great little town. I had a good time. I don't have a bad thing to say about Tuscaloosa. And then I graduated. I moved to Las Vegas for the summer, lived with my parents. And then I went to Nashville, Tennessee. And then the okay. reason that I moved out of Nashville is because the job I, that I got next was based in Miami. And I was working for Pomp and big crypto person. And he had an in-person office for the company that was the same space as the studio so right all he has a lot of very cool guests on his show and mm -hmm. um they would just come he in blew and kind up of on twitter he blew oh, yeah. up on twitter man it's crazy exactly and all these like really cool people would come into the office every day to go on a show and they would obviously like hang out and just chat so it was like a really i was like i need to be there to like have the opportunity to meet all these people who I wouldn't have any opportunity to meet otherwise and mm -hmm. again, working with Pompey, someone I think is like very successful and someone I admire in a lot of ways. And, you know, I get to just organically, you know, we're going to naturally spend more time together if I'm in the office. He's going to be like, anyone want to go get coffee? And then you take a walk together, right? Like very basic things that I wouldn't have the opportunity to build that personal relationship with if I right. was remote. Because otherwise, our relationship would just be like about business, for example. So I moved to Miami. Uh, well, I say I moved to Miami. I drove my car from Tennessee to Miami. Um, but by the time that I had got there, they actually like didn't have the office totally open and operational yet. Um, actually, that's not quite true. Um, so he like was running several businesses at the time. The point is, it didn't, I didn't really have any reason to be there. Like, yes, yeah, so right. because Pomp wasn't running that company. There was a different CEO. And he wasn't there yet. He was still moving cross country at the time. And I just like didn't. That was Well, actually, what had happened was there was someone who was supposed to lend me an apartment and then that kind of fell through at the last minute. And so I was like, I don't have enough of a reason to be here to like want to live by myself and pay Miami prices based on how much I was making at the time. And I was like, I'll just come back in a couple months. Um, and I think I had some other stuff I want to do on the West Coast. So I ended up back in Las Vegas at my parents' house again for a little while. And that was probably like February of 2022. And I ended up just living at home and traveling super frequently. So like I had friends who lived on the beach in California. I had friends like who lived in various, like all over, like I had a friend in DC. I had a cousin in Ohio. I had a friend in Atlanta. I st spent a lot of time with my grandparents. So I just spent like a week working remotely in various parts of the country and then kind of always returning home as like home base. And then I love that around. Yeah, it was great. And again, I felt I was able to do that because I, I did have a job right where I had like obligations to meet. Like if I didn't put in a certain level of work, they would have let me go, which is how it should be. Um, and that's right. how I was able to focus just fine. And then 
that's around the end of that summer is when my business partner from Orbit Metrics was like, hey, like this is starting to heat up. Um, what would your interest be in joining me? And that's when I had decided to do that. And so then I moved to Scottsdale we, to live with him and like just scrappy, get that off the ground such that he was motivated to quit his job as well to also go full-time on nice. it. And that was September of 2022. And then I we lived together for a while. Then he moved out to move in with his girlfriend. And so then I was like, all right, at least it's up. I kind of moved to Arizona to live with you and build this business. And we've built it to the point where you're self-employed by the business as well. And you live with your girlfriend now. And like, I don't have a reason to be in Arizona anymore. So then I went to Mexico City. So I drove my car from Scottsdale to Nevada. And I left my car and I put all my stuff in storage in Arizona. And I went to Mexico City on a one-way flight. And then I got super sick, lots of food poisoning, which was, you know, eventful. And then at the same time, we had hired a full-time software engineer at our business. And that was honestly something we could not have afforded. Like we expected a couple of deals to come through and increase MRR. And then the deals didn't come through. And then also the engineer wasn't quite as good as, um, wasn't quite, I don't want to say it wasn't quite as good. He didn't have the specific skill set we needed. He was a fine engineer, but he didn't have like the niche expertise that we thought he needed. And, um, I, uh, we lost like several clients. So like he started deals, didn't go through and we lost significant amount of MRR. And so basically the bank account was like racing towards zero. And I was like in Mexico with food poisoning. And oh, shit. It, so basically I just like kind of panicked and came back to Arizona and stayed with a friend for like a week, uh, to like help my business partner solve the problems together. And we had basically, and things were looking quite bleak for like the month of September. And we call it the September scramble in retrospect. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is too stressful for me to like rent out an Airbnb. They're all expensive. I don't like want any of this. So I just signed like another 12 month lease in Arizona, just like five months ago. And then okay. I got that lease and then we decided to rent an office together so we could work together. Like that's what you were hinting at earlier. So then like September through December, we had an office space in Arizona that I could bike to from my new apartment and it was great. And then in December, like 15th, I was at home for Hanukkah. And a friend called me. He's like, I'm moving to New York City next month. Blah, 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 blah. We're just catching up casually. And I was like, that sounds really fun. I kind of want to go with you. And so I just like called my current new roommate in Arizona, who I just moved in with in September. And was like, dude, I really want to move to New York. And he's like, sure. And like he was living with his girlfriend. And I, I don't know if they like want, they're kind of okay to have the place to themselves. So he's like, I'm fine right. taking over the whole place. Um, just go for it. I don't care. So I didn't have to find That's the sublease awesome. or anything. That was like super painless. And our office lease for the company had pretty much ended. So that was pretty much done. And so I just packed up Christmas day, drove back to Vegas, uh, just gave him all the furniture. I was like, you got me out of my lease, like keep all the stuff. Like it's helpful. And I didn't really give him that much. It was just like a bookshelf and a desk. And then I moved to Vegas for three weeks. Then I came here, stayed with a family friend. This is where I currently am. And then I'm getting a one month place in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, starting tomorrow. And I can get wow. to like the motivations for why I'm here, I suppose, but just have that appeal, man. The New York energy, it just like to be social, yeah. like to have large groups, like the running groups on Twitter. Got a lot of FOMO, seeing all these like fun running groups. Like in Arizona, right. I could not find anyone to run with. Like I didn't look that hard, but then like my second yeah. day here, I show up to this group run and it's like 60 people and they're all cool and friendly. And I'm like, that would have taken a really long time to build in Arizona. And that there's like 10 yeah. of those every day here. That's amazing. That's amazing. That That is sometimes that's all the motivation you need is just, just to feel that different energy. And even like you said, if you're not there for for the long term, it's just like almost getting like a little bit of that recharge that you needed and that you yes. were looking for and just kind of moving, moving to the next thing. Now that's, uh, that's really awesome. And man, what a what a cool way to, you know, uh, kind of build everything as you're going to these different places and coming to Arizona to be with you. That's a really, really cool uh, backstory. And I think that's uh, really inspiring because I think sometimes people just kind of uh, fall short to just like get confined and comfortable in like one place. And I think that um, that, that says a lot in terms of how you're just approaching different things and, you know, uh, enjoying your your freedom that you have now, because who knows what can happen and, you know, uh, however long you get, you know, married you have a relationship you need to be kind of more in one place or whatever that might be so um i i uh give you a, a lot of props for that dude i, I definitely realized that like this freedom is short-lived like it's not indefinite and like i do plan to like 
accumulate commitments that make it less difficult to do. So I kind of feel mm-hmm. like I'm going to use it while I can because yeah, I don't expect absolutely. to have it forever. Exactly. Exactly. Well, at the, at the same time, like you, you've done enough, uh, you know, you've done enough work now to understand how, like how to build a business that doesn't require so much of your attention. So listen, at the end of the day, if you know how to have that skill set and you know how to approach that, I think, uh, you can continue having as much of the freedom as you allow yourself until you, like you said, you start accumulating commitments that you actually choose to. And, uh, then you can be like, okay, my time's a little bit more confined to one space, but, uh, that's, uh, that's really, really dope, dude. And, um, yeah, I, uh, I I know that you got to probably uh, run in a little bit. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, kind of chat about? Anything that um, you got coming up? You got you guys are doing on, you know, YouTube stuff and all that. Like anything else you, you want to touch on? It's a good question. I was, you know, you got me thinking about a lot of fun things. I, I definitely think a lot about the alignment. Like that's the big yeah. thing that like, how do I you know, you could reverse engineer in two ways, right? How do I, what causes me to be unsuccessful as we've discussed? So I think, and this is something that even Dickie Bush talks about a lot. He's like, don't aim to write and edit in the same session. Don't, don't, don't try to do that. Don't try to come up with a yeah. topic and then write and then edit in the same session. That is a formula for failure. Um, because it's just like, that's why people have writer's block. Versus if all you're going to do is in this session, I'm going to come up with 10 ideas and skeleton a couple of potential blog posts based on that. And then you go to write and you already have an outline. And it's like, oh, I'm just filling out this outline. And then you go to edit and you're like, oh, I'm just editing. Like very easy. Right. So right. I like that type of thinking is like, what are the core things that are important to me to do? And what what is the way what, in, in ways when they're structured in certain ways, mm-hmm. I'm successful. And other times I'm fail Like I don't. I'm not successful. Why does that happen? Like why? Almost so, like a log of those things, a, a log of those situations where you can kind of see when I do this, it's not exactly. successful. You start seeing the patterns yeah, everywhere yeah. across your life. Mm-hmm, and so, mm-hmm. you know, you were telling me that you decided to restructure this podcast to be, you didn't like the feeling of needing to do it forever. Right. But you mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm excited about it again. I'm going to do another batch of 10 episodes. So that is something mm-hmm. you've done at the outset to structure the situation with your motivations and your commitment and your effort level and the tasks such that it feels good, such that like you're going to do it. You're not going to be dreadful about doing it, but it's still enough to be meaningful and be worthwhile, but it's not for the rest. Like you had to kind of put the puzzle together in such a way that it would work. But if you had decided Mm -hmm. I'm going to do an episode every week for the rest of the year, that might've scared you. That might've felt limiting, right? That might've not scared you in terms of like, it's yeah, too difficult, yeah, yeah. but like you might have felt hesitant Mentally. to make that commitment. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you're like, well, I don't know if I'm going to want to be doing it by the end of the year, but I can like, so I think a lot about that, both on like, micro like I said, commitments. The, those exactly it, it's micro commitments. And then in the abstract, it's just the meta pattern of like setting yourself up for success in the things that you do. And it's the same thing where it's just like, I don't want to just say like all of this is maybe just a rant about smart goals, like the idea of like successful, measurable, achievable, results oriented, time bound. Mm-hmm. But like, I suppose that is also like not, not the case, but the more often right. that you do that, I, I would also just include like, again, you have to have a why involved or, but like you have to, and again, the why has to be sufficiently good in sufficiently strong in proportion to the difficulty. So like, I don't think you have to, bend over backwards to produce 10 podcast episodes over like a small time period. So like you didn't, you're just like, because it sounds fun, like it sounds fun. And I want to connect with people. That is a strong enough why to do something of this level of difficulty. But if it was like, I need to do a thousand, right. You need to have a stronger why to, to commit to that. So it's like, for me, like to wake up at 5am and start a work day, I'm not going to do that on a day where I don't feel like I need to, because it just sucks too much. But if I like Mm -hmm. have an urgent deadline for a client that like, if we lose the business is hurt, like, I'm going to have, I'm going to jump out of bed and be go. It's like, yeah, all the things that are important to me, how do I set them up either with my motivations being hyper clear again, maybe I have to arbitrarily, if there's not good enough motivation, maybe I need to arbitrarily reward myself. Like, like I'll give a friend $500. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And say like, give me this $500 back when I X, Y, and Z. And the same thing with like your fitness goals. Right. And like, so the 75, I wanted to touch that on right that now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was about to ask you about because you talked about routines earlier and like the whole Hermosi comparison, which I absolutely love that you touched on that because uh, I definitely have that thought as well as like the circumstances. But tell me about a little bit 
kind of the alignment in the morning with the morning routine you're doing? You said 75 hard. Um, I kind of explain what that is for people that don't know, but like, I think that's definitely part of the daily alignment. And I know that is at least for me, I can speak for myself is like doing hard things in the morning and getting myself to be to the point where, oh, I already feel like I've accomplished the hardest thing. This is going to be easy. And that mindset gives me flow, gives me room to breathe. It gives me room to be creative. So I, I'd love to hear what your morning routine is around that too. Yeah, 75 hard. I'm not necessarily doing any part of it in the morning. I have not okay. had a routine since I've been here. If a routine means doing the same things at the same time of day, I've not had one whatsoever. Uh, besides that, like my day starts by waking up, right? Like, duh. Right. Like, that is like the <laughs> most, <laughs> that's about like the level. And I brush my teeth at some point, usually in the morning, right, right? Right, usually right. after once I've decided that I'm done drinking coffee is usually when I brush my teeth. Um, anyway, personal details. <laughs> 75 hard is a program that again, for whatever reason works really well for me and may not work really well mm -hmm. for other people, but that's why I love it is that it works well for me because I like the challenge of it. There's like a feeling of accomplishment. I always have done it with friends who are doing it with me. So there's accountability built into it. And that's another ingredient for success sometimes as far as the components of it. And I like that it demands perfection. I like that it's binary, meaning it's hyper clear. Like there is no ambiguity about doing it. So the six things that are required every day, you have to do two workouts. One of them has to be outside. They both need to be at least 45 minutes and they're not supposed to be consecutive. There's a little bit of ambiguity about what consecutive means. But basically like you can't walk to the gym, work out and walk home and call that the workout. But sometimes it's like okay. you work out, you eat breakfast, maybe take a meeting, take another workout. Like it doesn't have to be morning and night or something, for example, um, just somewhat non-consecutive. And then you have to set your own parameters for diet and then follow those parameters. No cheat meals, no drinking alcohol, take a progress picture, drink a gallon of water, and then uh, read 10 pages of nonfiction. And Okay. Then you have to do all those things every day, no days off consecutively for 75 days. And if you, you know, make any mistakes or screw up, you start over at day zero. And I just like the zero compromises, pass fail mentality is just easy for me. I feel accomplished. It's great to go outside every day. There's days when it's like, like I've really hurt my feet like a couple of weeks ago. Like they're not better yet. Um, not a big deal, but like, I just like got big bruises on the back of both my feet. And like, I just can't wear closed toe shoes right now. Like all of my shoes just hurt to wear. And it, like, it was raining outside in New York and it was like 30 degrees. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just going to go for a walk in the rain in Burks and socks. Cause like every other pair of shoes hurt. <laughs> it's just like, that's my choice. Like fail this challenge and start yeah. over or just like go take a walk for 45 minutes in right. socks in the rain, in the cold. It's like, oh, I love well. that. And that's just like, feels great to do like after and during, because you're just like, you're feeling that sense of commitment. So then the, the conversation I had with my business partner this week is like, I'm able to do shit that sucks when it's structured uh -huh. in the parameters of 75 hard, like whatever the circumstances are, the alignment of the variables, it works for me. So like, how do we come up with what if I executed every single day perfectly, perfectly, perfectly <laughs> would almost guarantee very good outcomes in the business. And like, why don't we build that same scorecard for work? And how do we get myself to psychologically buy into it with the same level of conviction such that like when I had a flight to New York, I knew I had to do two workouts and I knew one of them had to be outside. And I knew I was going to be like lose 10 hours of my day to travel that I woke up and got on the Peloton at 4 a.m. Right? Like that takes a lot of motivation, but it, well, that was easy. But like, I would never do that if I didn't have the parameters of the challenge. And like, there's, mm -hmm. I can't, how do I get myself waking up at 4 a.m. to do the proactive, most important business work? I have to structure it so it feels essential. Like I have to, has to make sense in my head. And so that's kind of what yep. I'm working on now is like aligning the circumstances, the motivation, the mentality, the mindset, the why around preparing myself to absolutely crush consistent execution the same way that I'll go for a walk in the, like there are things that are so much easier that I procrastinate for work because I don't have that same level of necessity, urgency. What happens if I fail? I can always push that off to tomorrow. There is no pushing off the workout to tomorrow because the weather, you fail the challenge. And I don't know, but I've bought into it. And so now I'm doing it. And so how do I make something for the other things I need to do to match the same level? It works for me. How do I make other stuff work for yeah. me that is like less arbitrary? Dude, I, I absolutely love that. And I like the, that, that whole pattern of that commitment, I'm, I'm literally, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how the hell do you take that and you apply it to just like the work and like the, like, why the, does ship the 30 creators. for 30 work? 
right? Like for some reason it works. Dude, that's, I mean, I don't know if you know the backstory, but that's how I got into, uh, into writing online is because I needed that confinement of just ship 30 pieces. Like it wasn't anything great. I even was telling somebody else on on our own, come up with like, just write every day for 30 days. I don't know, Mm -hmm. but this guy Dickie tells Mm -hmm. me to, and he says to take a screenshot of it and it's specific enough and it's easy enough, but it's hard enough. And I managed to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just like, how do I copy that, but do it for something less random? Exactly. Do do it for yourself. So nobody, it doesn't have to be this public facing thing It's just more so like, this is accountability for myself. And this is what I'm doing 75 minutes of straight, like, you know, doing this thing or these three things or whatever that might be. Yeah, it's a it's an amazing uh, process. But I think that uh, I think in order to even keep that's the you know, the, the practice, I think is every day is just like, it's like yoga, you never get you never beat yoga. It's you're always practicing just to do a little <laughs> you bit. You never better. beat yoga. You, exactly. You never beat yoga, you know. And I think that um, that to me is always like something I keep in mind because I do it pretty much on like a daily basis in one way or another. Um, and so for me, it's just this thing of like, how do I? Because I I think there's a there's like a prerequisite almost to get to that point where you can be in that space of hey, for 75 minutes, I have to do this for seven, you know, this is what I have to do throughout the day, those things. I think you need to have that, you need to build that consistency ahead of time. Because if you, uh, like you said earlier, it's like, oh, I'm going to record a thousand episodes. That's a little bit too overwhelming for people. Like you need to start small. And I think you have to have that consistency with something you can say hey i'm consistent every day at fucking opening my phone and going on instagram and recording a (laughs) video now how do i transfer that over to something a little bit more productive that actually like my friend pia said it perfect she goes something that makes your heart beat a little bit differently and it's like what is that thing is it is it your work that gets you excited is it writing is it this and start transferring that consistency and i think in order to get to that point i mean Every day I am just trying to, you know, like my morning routine as consistent as it can be. And then once that's done, it's like it starts to get a little bit more fragmented and there's not so much of it. And I think like just adding enough things in your day to have some sort of routine, but not bind it to the fact that if you don't do it, for example, you know, if you say like, I'm going to record a thousand episodes, you miss one, it doesn't break the entire chain. You're just like, I just got to get back on that horse and having that mental psychology to be able to do that to yourself because i let's talk about ship 30 for a second it's like don't don't miss twice right like that was the yeah. whole thing it's like you can miss once you can but don't miss twice like that's when you start getting the second third and fourth day and stuff like that so um yeah there's got to be always a little bit of a balance and i feel like uh, i'm just it's awesome to hear you talk about this because i think about this a lot and i in, in in times other than having a conversation like this, it's kind of hard to relay that to other people. You almost have to have somebody like you have a consistent thing that you're doing. I have a consistent thing. Like we're kind of have a similar frequency, but if somebody's not consistent with anything and somebody is really consistent, you, it's going to be very hard to find that like balance and understanding each other. And what you're saying is just like really, really clicks with me because I notice I'm aware of my ADHD and the things that I, you know, tangent off into with my mind. And I start thinking about one thing, I'm listening to a song, it's something else comes to mind, I stop that I start this, and there's this like constant thing. And I, I think there's just something to to what you're saying, that's really uh, impactful from like, just like a psychological perspective. Yeah, it's, I'll make like one more point on this. And then we can, can wrap it up like our engineer, and he's one of our co founders. So it's like, again, I define people by like their role, but it's like, we're all equal mm-hmm. co founders, but we call him our engineer, right? He's the main engineer on the team for um, building like a lot of our internal tools. Like he tries mm-hmm. to not work on anything the day he comes up with the idea. He tries to like, like he kind of purposefully disenfranchises himself because of like, you could call it ADHD like behaviors. It's like he knows mm-hmm. his own behavior where he's going to get excited about something that isn't actually the most important thing, but because he had the idea and he's excited about it, with the ADHD type behaviors, you think it's the most important thing in the world. So then you start working on it ahead of what's actually the most important thing. So he's like, guys, Mm -hmm. like he proactively helps us manage. Like we're not in charge of managing him. We're co-founders, but it's like, we want to work better together. Like we all like my, like I don't have a systems orientation right away. And so my business partner, who's not in charge of managing me, but kind of is like, he wants me to be successful is like, yells at me all the time for like not building systems and it's annoying, but then the next day I'm glad he did. Right. I'm very glad he did. And same thing. It's like, Ethan, you know, you're on one of your 
tangents where you're building something that feels cool because you just had the idea, but we don't actually need it. And so it's like he tries to, he like set up the rule for himself. This was his idea that like he can't work on anything without our, like any code stuff without our approval. It's like, obviously mm -hmm. we don't need to micromanage him like that, but it's like, it actually is helpful. And so I think like some of this people might be listening to this and like, I, like it's kind of seeing yourself in a childish way. Like I think that with this marketing work, I really shouldn't be able to like start my week without showing my to-do list to the rest of my team and getting their buy in the same way. They're like, Lewis, I don't think you understand the task of write out the ICP well enough where you're going to be. I don't think you're going to succeed at that. I know you. I know that that's not clear enough. I don't know what it is, like what completing that looks like. You probably like don't start any work, like go define that, flesh it out, then come back. Mm -hmm. And like, it's yep. going to be annoying every single time they say that to me. Like, I'm going to hate yeah. it so much, but like, I also would rather be successful and have friction than like fail and like have not had the friction. So yep. getting past ourselves, man, getting out of our own way. I know. It, and sometimes you have to purposely is. disenfranchise yourself and purposely tell people to do things you don't like such that you get out of your own way. Yeah. Do you, uh, I love that. Uh, do you have any, um, just for people, because I know everyone's always like, to have, do you have any like tools or ta uh, task managers, task list things that you use religiously to get like yourself at least to a point where you can kind of focus on something a little bit more confined? Like, is there, a, there's there like a little system around that? I know you're not big of a systems guy, but is there anything around that that you feel like this thing really helped me, like really gets me kicked off in, in the middle of the day? Like I need to get this task list. I need to knock these things out. Or is it just kind of like, hey, like whatever I can get to at the at that moment? Yeah, I'm trying to gamify it. I'm trying to gamify it. Um, mm -hmm. We do sprints. We do agile, even for non-technical mm -hmm. work. So that is a proven methodology for like breaking down large projects into epics, which are like you know groups yeah. of like thematically grouped topics related to a thing. So like, let's say you're building an application, right? An epic might be like you know the authentication system, the user interface, the database. Yeah. Those might be three different epics. Then user stories are the subcomponents of the epic, which are completable then user stories mm -hmm. have the definition of done and the success criteria. So the system is just like have a backlog, which is the list of epics and then have it be groomed, meaning like the next two to three weeks worth of potential work are defined with a time estimate and the definition of done and that success criteria, and then have a weekly sprint meeting where the rest, they're like, this is the, these are the user stories I'm going to complete this week. I'm going to put them in mm -hmm. this list as having approved of that. And then just like only work on those things. Um, so that's, that's like the system is like adopted the proven methodology of doing things. It's like saying right, like, like if you're right. going to start a country from scratch, right? Like yeah. you'd probably be wise to like study like government. <laughs> like you're not going to like come up with like the social coordination mechanisms on your own. Like you might want to like, yeah. like, you know, the yeah. US like, okay, it's not perfect, right? It's not perfect. But like they did manage to stay alive for like 300 years and like, Right. Civil war and external wars and Great Depression and like all these bad things happen, but it still works kind of like there might be something to learn from that. So it's like same thing yeah. with like anything. It's just like, yeah. OK, big companies have tackled bigger projects, coordinating a thousand people like, you know, they weren't perfectly on time. But like, you know, they, they, there's price like proven systems, proven methodologies, just mm -hmm. adopt them. So mm -hmm. I didn't invent agile. Yeah. I was just like people figured out how to get work done. And it works for you. And it like, it clicks Someone. with your brain. That you're like, yeah, it does. It's, it's 80%, 70% there. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. Uh, yeah. No, I, I don't think, yeah, I don't when think it doesn't work, it's my fault, not the system's fault. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think it's going to be a hundred percent because I think that's when we become robots. And I think there's something, um, you know, to that, but no, man, I, I uh, truly enjoyed chatting with you, dude. And thanks for sharing all your all your things and uh maybe if you want to kind of uh, wrap it up with letting people know where to find your podcast and uh you know social media and any of your any of the work that you're doing with uh with the data side of things and the ghost writing side of things and all that yeah i'd say twitter is a good entry point for all of it i know you're big on twitter mm -hmm. so lewis shulman on twitter spelling is obviously the same as it is on this episode my podcast is on spotify it's also on youtube that's the lewis and kyle show if you like this podcast, but you're like, man, if only Zlatko would talk more. He was so much smarter than his guests. <laughs> I do have an episode with Zlatko, so you can listen to him yeah. be the star of the show. Uh, so check that out. That's a great place to start out with my show. And 
the businesses are inboxghosts.com or metrics.io. I'm easy to find on the internet. Like most of the things aren't too competitive in the namespace. So my stuff comes up. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Lewis, thank you so, so much, man. It's always a, a, always a pleasure chatting and I'm so glad we actually got to uh, meet in real life. And I've uh, always been talking about, or more recently, I should say, I've been talking about, you know, in real life communities and with like-minded people. And it seems like you're in one way through all your travels and all that kind of looking for those in, in maybe a little bit more like spurts where you find that community yeah. of people, whether it's running or whatever that might be. I think, I think that's becoming more and more important as been, as we've been all like kind of tied to these screens and, you know, all this shit that happened these past few years with like the pandemic and all that. So um, I, I applaud you, man, on all the, all the cool stuff you're doing, all the businesses and everything. And I'm uh, glad you're enjoying yourself and uh, yeah, man, look forward to chatting again. And thanks for, uh, thanks for jumping on, dude. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Cheers, brother. Cheers.